Amy Dupel, and I'm co-chair of the Partnerships Committee who helped organize this event. So um, we're really excited for today's event with Julie Brown. Um, Julie is a motivating, high-energy speaker, teaching the importance of networking and why you are your best business development tool. Um, Julie's been invited to speak on the power of networking and relationship building by numerous conference organizations and private companies across the country. So we're super honored to have her here today. Um, she is the author of This Shit Works, a no-nonsense guide to networking your way to more friends, more adventures, and more success, a book dedicated to making networking easy, accessible, and fun. I actually just started it and love it so far. And um, she's also the host of the This Shit Works podcast, dedicated to all things business development and currently a commuting favorite of mine. Um, <laughs> it's just like, it's the perfect amount of time for my commute. So I've been loving them, but, um, yeah, so Julia's advice, uh, strikes the perfect balance of humor and expertise gained for more than 20 years of networking experience. Uh, she shows you how anyone at any stage of their career can be unapologetically who they are, um, and still be wildly successful. So with that said, I will hand it off to Julie. Um, feel free to pop any questions you have in the chat. She will be stopping periodically um, to see if anybody has any questions, but if you're more comfortable typing them in the chat, I'm more than happy to ask them for you. So take it away, Julie. Thanks. Okay, so just for a little bit, if people could put on their cameras just for a minute, and I know some of you are gonna be like, oh, I didn't know it was gonna be on camera. We don't care. We don't care what you look like. You know, just put on your camera because I have a couple of questions. So this helps me like figure out what the demographics of the audience are. So when you saw my name and you were like, oh, Julie Brown's giving a presentation. How, how many of you hands up said downtown Julie Brown? <laughs> As I get older, the fewer hands go up. It's like, like, you know, so I've been in the industry for 22 years. I've been in the architecture, engineering and construction industry for 22 years. Like. I've been Julie Brown for 16 and a half years because it's my married name. And little by little over the years, like that name, like that moniker, downtown Julie Brown, people aren't knowing what it is. But when I get into an, uh, an event of like people my age, people are like, oh my God, it's downtown Julie Brown. All right. So that was the first question. The second question is, for those of you who were able to pour a cocktail, put it in, put it in the chat, what you are drinking right now. I am drinking, I'm a big tequila fan. So I'm drinking a pineapple um, coconut margarita with Blanco tequila. Adam, Adam Arsenault, what do you got? You're going to be my guy the whole time today. <laughs> I got a six point crisp. Oh, it's, yeah, uh, those are good. Beer. Those are good. Actually, Brooklyn. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Rob's his cheap vodka and was whatever was laying around in the fridge. Oh, Black Girl Magic Rosé. Who's got that? Put it up. Black Girl Magic Rosé. I've been wanting to try that and it's always sold out where I am. Yeah, you have to snag it once it gets restocked. So I buy them in like cases. <laughs> yeah, and it's good. Oh, I've been wanting to try that. Their whole brand is amazing. Their red blend. Um, it's an amazing company by two amazing sisters. You'd yeah. enjoy it. Um, are those the McBride sisters? Is yes. That, that's yeah, yep, okay. the McBride sisters. Yep. Okay. All right. All right. Another, I'm still in the office. No drinks for me. See, when you own your own company, you just have a beer fridge in your, in your office. So oh, yay, entrepreneurship. <laughs> um, so the second question is, what is the best show you binged on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, whatever during COVID? Shit's Creek, yeah. Younger. Shit's Creek by far. <laughs> Virgin River. Yeah, I heard that's great. Oh, Ted Lasso. I hear that's awesome. Upload alias Ozarks. Yeah, Ozarks. I I don't know what my best one was. I'll tell you what I'm watching right now. I'm watching Fargo on Hulu. That's what I'm watching right now. And I can't stop saying, oh, you betcha. Every time somebody says something to me, I'm like, oh, you betcha. <laughs> oh, we can't forget T Tiger King gets lost because it was right at the beginning. It was right at the beginning. Yeah. Killing Eve is awesome. Yeah. Those are all great. 
Okay, so that was just a little icebreaker. Get everybody comfortable looking at me with their cameras and putting stuff in the chat. So now I'm going to share my screen. You'll only see me. Um, during this, you can ask questions whenever you want in the chat. I'm going to have pre-prescribed breaks where I'm like, are, did, have I lost anybody? Are we still here? Um, so for right now, I'm going to share my screen so that I can get going. I'm going to present. Is this good for everybody? Can everybody see it? Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So today we're talking about the future of networking, how to success succeed in a virtual world. We just did our icebreaker. We talked about our cocktails. I'm going to give some networking stats. I'm going to talk about how to analyze the network that you already have and break it down. I'm going to give you five networking tools that you can use right now or you can use in the future. And then I'm going to talk about sort of the stages of building relationships. So networking stats and why it's so important. Uh, okay. So 33% of workers are expected to be laid off during the pandemic. I've been in the industry for 22 years and this is my third downturn, my third recession. So we had the dot-com burst, we had the subprime mortgage, um, you know, recession, and then now obviously the global pandemic. So this is the third time that I've in my career that I've faced a recession or a downturn in the market. So during COVID, 33% of workers are going to, are expected to be laid off. Now, why is that? What does that have to do with networking? Well, everything, because 85% of positions are filled through networking. So that's because 26% or fewer jobs are ever advertised. So if you have a friend who's lost their job, or if you are looking for a job, even if you haven't been laid off and you're looking for a job, and you're relying on things you see on LinkedIn or on job boards or on company websites, like literally, that's 26% of the jobs that are out there. 74% of the jobs are filled by word of mouth. Owning two companies, I know this for a fact, when, when we are looking for architects for our architecture firm, we don't post it. We call people and say, hey, we're looking to fill this position. Do you know anybody? That's how 74% of the jobs are filled. So if you're not networking and you're not in touch with the people who are looking for those to fill those positions, you're, you're not going to have a, a chance at those jobs. That's why it's so important. And you know, studies show that professionals who spend six hours a week networking agree that it plays a vital role in their success. And I can already, like, I can't see you right now because I can only see my screen, but I can kind of see you going like six hours. Where does this woman think I'm going to find six hours? We don't usually have a, a, a time issue problem. We have a time management problem. And the way that I do networking, you can fit it into every single part of your life. And before you know it, you're, you don't even know that you're networking and you're networking. Um, Inside your office, and this is super important for women, networking with others inside your office will allow you to get to know people who can provide support, advancement, put you, know, put you um, on stretch projects, uh, allow you to have access to promotions like now and into the future. So learning how to network inside the office that you're in is super important, especially for women. Women network totally different than men. And men don't have a fear of networking up with networking pe with people who are leaders in their firms. And, and women tend to not do that as much as men. And that is why studies show that one of the single biggest limiting factors for women in business is lack of a network because they not network completely differently than men. Um, so those, that's, those are the stats around why it's so important. And there's a million stats. Those are the ones I picked. So let's think about the network that you already have and how to anal analyze it. Everybody has a network. No matter where you are in your career, you have a network. So let's think about analyzing that. Make a list, go through your phone, go through LinkedIn, make a list of all of the people you know. And you will see that you know more people than you think you do. But there's a caveat here. You have to have least at, at, have met them or met them virtually, meaning you've had a conversation with them 
face-to-face in a Zoom meeting. Prior to COVID, I would have said, you have to have met them. If you haven't met them, then it doesn't count. But now that this is the way that we've been doing business for the past you know, 12 months, I, I put met in quotation parts, meaning you can have a Zoom meeting with them and that is considered meeting, but you have to have met them. You know, your 400 friends on Facebook, that's not your network if you haven't met them or had a conversation with them. So within that list, if you're a recent grad, I do a lot of speeches to emerging leaders and I do lectures at colleges and universities. So if you're a recent grad or you're about to graduate, you make a list of your coaches, your peers, your teachers, your family, your friends of family and your friends. When you're a professional, you make a list of all of your professional connections, your architects, your consultants, your builders, your projects teams, your contemporaries, your alumni networks, your friends, your family, and friends of family. And you will see that you know more people than you think you do. So now after we make that list, what we have to do is we actually have to quantify it. Our network is made up of of circles, of strengths of circles. And this is how it breaks down. Categorizing your network. Your top five. I'm not telling you you haven't something you haven't heard before. You've all heard this, that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So if you think about networking and business development, who are you spending your most, most time with? And are those people invested in your success? Are you invested in your top five success? Do you help each other succeed? Do you give each other information, access to other people Um, through strategic introductions that will help them. And there was an article by Warren Buffett a few years ago that said the, the most successful people in the world have one thing in common. And that one thing is a spouse or a life partner uh, who is invested in their success. So your husband, your wife, your boo, your schnookums, whatever, that person needs to be invested in your success. There needs to be um, an equality to e- each of you being invested in the other person's career. And we've seen this a lot during COVID where women have been expected to give up their careers to homeschool the kids or whatnot. There has to be a parity in who's in, in putting your, your careers on, on the same level. So think about your top five. Your, your person, your spouse, your husband, your boo, your shokums, whatever, has to be in there. And then who else rounds out your top five? Who else are you spending the most time with? And are you spending the most time with the right people as far as are, you, are they invested in your success and helping you be better? And are you invested in their success? So the next circle is what I call the party people. And it's not because you party with them. It's like if you were going to throw a birthday party or if you were going to throw a party for your company, who would be the after your top five? Who would be the next people you would just rattle off? You know they would be there for you. You know they want to support you. That is the party people. That's the circle of 15. And then going further out, I call it the robust 50. Do you have 50 robust connections? Do you have 50 people beyond the circles that we've already discussed where you could email, you hear about a lead and you could email 50 people and say, I heard about this. Have you heard anything? What do you know? What can you tell me? Like, do you have those kinds of connections? When you're looking for a job, do you have 50 people you could say, um, I'm, I'm thinking that you trust that you say, I'm thinking about changing positions. You know, let's keep this on the DL. Do you know anybody who might be looking like, do you have 50 Robux, robust connections? Have you invested in 50 relationships beyond the five and the 15? And then the outer network, the outer network is super important. And this is also one of the difference, differences between men and women. Men are really great at having loose transactional networks where like they keep um, sort of loosely connected to people and are really good at keeping loosely connected to people. And the circle of a hundred is powerful because remember that statistic in the beginning, 85% of jobs are filled through networking. Guess what? They're filled through the outer circle, that circle of a hundred. Women tend to network in smaller condensed circles and in smaller social circles, less transactional, meaning they don't talk about business as much. So you have to think about like how big and broad and wide can I make my network and how transactional can I make it as well? So 
that's how to categorize your circles. Are there any questions before I get on to networking tools? I'm curious just where the stats of that came from, female versus male. I'm sorry, the stats on how we network differently? Yes, and how men are more successful with their 100% outer loop. Yeah, so I, it's funny, my my podcast, because I have podcast, my podcast next week is all on sort of Mars versus Venus, how women network differently than men. And so I have like I have are all these articles that show the studies around it. And and I can give I'm not I can't see who's asking the question, but I could certainly email you afterwards and and give you the articles that state what I just said, if that's if that's helpful. It was like Fast Company, Forbes, Forbes, INC, like that's where the articles in the study the articles were quoting the studies. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. This okay. Is, this is Allie from Hayworth. We just, we have a women's committee and we were just talking about the differences and I think it would be really beneficial. So yeah. So That's Allie, nice. my email, if you would email me, my email is julie at juliebrownbd.com. Shoot me an email and I'll send you these articles. And then also I'll send you next Wednesday. I'll send you a link to the podcast. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So this is Nikisha. I have one other question. Sure. So if typically a person spends, you know, six hours a week with networking mm -hmm. and time management is our biggest issue. And I know it's one of mine. How would you suggest managing your time? Because I'm, you know, virtually when I'm working from home, it's 8 a.m. to sometimes midnight or like yeah. last night, 2 a.m. in the morning to get out a project. Yep. So what are like some strategies on time management in the post pandemic world? In th so this is a great question. And I interviewed for my podcast a while back, a woman who actually is just a productivity consultant. And she told me about this wonderful thing called the Pom Pomodoro technique. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but basically it's, if we can put, if we can in our calendar can put together times, they call it the Pomodoro effect because the man who um, Pomodoro technique, because the man who designed it, literally he had a timer that looked like a tomato. Pomodoro tomato. So um, what she said is break down your calendar in, into uninterrupted Pomodoro times, which is, it can be 15 minutes. It can be 20 minutes. It can be 25 minutes. And what you do in that time is you don't let anything else distract you. So for me, a big thing for me is when I'm working on my computer, I have 7,000 open tabs. And what happens is when I'm working on something, like an email will shoot in or a text message will shoot in or another pop-up will shoot in and immediately I'm distracted. But during the Pomodoro technique, during this Pomodoro time that I set for myself, I shut everything else off and I only work on what I'm supposed to be working on. And I don't let distractions happen during that time. And what I've found is it actually takes me a lot less time to accomplish something than I think it's going to if I give it my my full attention. So that's one way I do it. The second way I do it to fit networking into my schedule is to realize that if I'm going to a networking event, like say this event, if it was a networking event, I don't have to be there for the whole thing. I can make a goal for that networking event. Okay, I'm gonna have a goal of meeting two new people. I'm gonna have two great conversations. I'm gonna get their contact information. I'm gonna be able to follow up tomorrow and then I'm gonna get out of Dodge because I don't wanna be at this networking event for two, three hours, you know, like, in-person events used to be. So just setting a goal for networking and sticking to that goal and allowing myself, giving myself the, you know, the ability to say, I've done enough, I'm leaving after having a goal for each networking. You don't have to meet every single person in a networking event for it to be a successful networking event. Um, so I hope that, I hope that helps. It, we're never going to get over like how much is being put on our plate and being asked of us. Um, but we can work more focused and we can set goals for ourselves that allow us to draw boundaries for how how long we're going to be at something. Thank you. That helps. Okay, great. Okay. So I'm going to move on just in the interest of time, but then afterwards, like the question and answer, you can ask any questions from any of the sections. So now I'm going to talk about networking tools and these are tools for now and into the future. Um, and these work like butter. Um, 
The first tool you have to understand in business is that you are your best networking tool. You are your best networking tool, your best business development tool. 100% of your clients are going to be people. You're a person. People buy from people. Um, being really good at your job is literally a barrier to entry right now. Congratulations. You're good at your job. So is everyone else who does that job. It was the first thing I told my husband when he started his architecture practice almost 11 years ago. I was like, congratulations, you're talented. So is everyone else. How are we going to stand out? And how you're going to stand out is you and how you build relationships and how you foster relationships. So know that you are your number one networking and business development tool. And the way I help people understand this is through a thing I call, I've made up, called the list yourself approach. And I, I created this approach because so many people said to me, well, I go to events and I don't know how to connect with people and I don't have anything to talk about. And I'm like, you have a shit ton to talk about. No one's just ever given you permission to say, I don't have to only talk about work. I can talk about myself and I can connect with somebody on a human level. So the list yourself approach is literally just this. You make a list of all of the things that make you, you. And so if I were going to make a list about myself, I would say, okay, I'm a wife. I'm a dog mom. I have two rescue dogs. If I told everybody to raise their hand, I can't see you. But if I told everybody to raise their hand who has dogs, like how many people would put their hands up? And I am a skier. How many people would put their hands up? I'm a marathon runner. How many people in the audience have run a marathon? I am a wine snob. How many people like wine? How many people like beer? How many people like tequila? Like hands going up everywhere. That's me. Beer snob, tequila snob, wine snob, travel buff. The COVID's killing me because I've had three vacations canceled. Grenada, Barbados, and Banff. I was supposed to be skiing in Banff. Um, huge travel buff. I've traveled all over the world. My last two trips before COVID was I skied the French Alps in Val d'Isere and the the trip before that I went on, well, I, it was my 15th wedding anniversary and we went to South Africa and we did all the things that you can die doing. We went great white shark diving and I jumped off the Victoria Falls Bridge, Bungie jumped off the Victoria Falls Bridge in Zambia and I went on safari and um, I also went wine tasting and French Shook and Stellenbosch. Like, traveling is my jam. So if I like was like, everybody was like, oh, who wants to travel again? Like who would raise their hand? Um, a mountain biker, I'm a huge mountain biker. I do a lot of things that could kill you. Um, I guess maybe I'm an adrenaline junkie. So I'm an avid podcast listener. I, I love producing my own podcast, but I love listening to other people's podcasts more. Obviously I, ne I binge a lot of shit on Netflix. Like that list yourself approach seems so benign. Like, oh, I'm going to make a list of all the things that I love to do and all the things that make me, me. But think about all of those things I just said and all the things I just said that you also have that in common. So here's the deal with the list yourself approach is it broadens the surface area with which you are allowed to connect with people beyond just what do you do for a living? Because people do business with and refer business to people they know, like, and trust. And when you find commonality with someone, when you can build a relationship with somebody off of commonality, you get to know, like, and trust a ton faster. And that's when people start recommending you and wanting to work with you. People want to work with people they like, and they like you if you have something in common and you can build your relationship off of that. You are your best networking tool. Know that networking is not about selling. It's about building this relationship so that you can help each other. If you go into a room and you're like, there's somebody in this room I can help, that changes the perspective of networking. I also say the people you meet will change your life. If you go into a room and you say, there's a potential of somebody in this room to change my life, that changes your perspective of networking. My life has been changed in hundreds of ways by the people that I meet. And I met them all through networking. So the second tool is your existing network. We talked about this a little bit. So make that list. Analyze your network. Who's in your five, 15, 50, 100? When was the last time you talked to them? Has it been three years? Well, send them an email and pick up the phone and be like, shit, it has been three years since we, we talked. I don't know how that time went by, but I was thinking about you today and I would love to reconnect. There is no chasm of time that cannot be bridged by saying, I've been thinking about you. Believe me, 
that makes people feel good. So you can reach that back out to anybody in your network, no matter how long the time has been. So one thing about networking is you have to know who you want to know. So reach, research the people you want to be connected to. You want to get to know and then use your existing relationships, leverage your existing relationships for new introductions. I say this all the time to people in my network. Who's in your network that I should know? Like who's in, I get that. Like who is like a badass woman? Who's like this, like whatever, like who's in your network that I should know? introductions from someone that you know to someone you don't know is called triadic closure. So it's called triadic closure because if you think of a triangle, there's three points. There's the person you know, there's you, and the person you don't know, but you share that common connection. It has been proven that if you are introduced to somebody you don't know through somebody you know, through a shared connection, through a mutual friend, your bond, your relationship with that person it grows at a faster rate than if you had just met willy-nilly without a common connection. So leverage your existing relationships for new introductions. I do this all of the time. And then don't only call when you need something. People, people see that. People see fake. They smell bullshit a mile away. Like don't only call when you need something. I had someone, I was being interviewed for a podcast today about networking. <laughs> Surprise, networking. Um, and the woman said to me, like, I had a woman reach out to me the other day and she was like, oh, I was thinking about you. How's the kids? And then in the next breath, she was like, oh, could you help me with this? And she was like, you weren't thinking about me. You weren't thinking about my kids. You needed something. So think about, can I create a cadence with which I reach back out to people thoughtfully and authentically before I need something so that when I do need something, I don't feel icky and gross asking for it. And then Tool number three are organizations. You get that. You're here. You're part of Cornet. You get the power of having an organization. So think about what other organizations are, are, are available to you. Alumni groups, other industry organizations. And don't just join. Yeah, research and join them. But don't just join them. Become involved. Become involved at the committee and board level and meet new people to increase your influence. When I sit in my, the offices of my clients and they say, oh, we'd really love an introduction to this and this developer. I'm like, I raise my hand and I'm like, well, I sit on the board with the VP of that development company. And then when they bring up another company, I'm like, well, I sit on the board with, with this person. Like sitting on boards is one of the surest fire ways to increase your influence because you have an excuse to be with those people every month and work with those people every month, elbow to elbow. So think about how can I become more involved in the organizations that I'm a part of? Or if I'm not a part of enough organizations, how can I get more involved? And then obviously events. Events are they're, for me, they're the crudita. Like I love going to events and meeting people and having that conviviality of events and you can still get them in, in virtual meetings. So each month, create a list of the networking events that are available to you and then decide in advance which to go to. And this will help with making sure that you have time to schedule these in your calendar. What I do is I say, okay, these are the networking events that are available to me. These are the ones that really, really interest me. And these are the ones I'm going to put on my calendar as non-negotiables. I'm not going to let other meetings trump them. I'm not going to be late for them. I am going to be present when I'm at them because it's so easy, especially now with virtual events. Maybe some of you are doing it right now while I'm talking. You're on other tabs. You've minimized me. And you're like, okay, I got to do all this work over here. And you're not actually really here. You're kind of here. Like, be present at those events. Decide which ones are important to you. Put them in your calendar. Make them non-negotiable and be present and say, I have a goal for this event. I'm going to talk to however many new people. I'm going to reconnect with this person that I haven't talked to in a while. Like, Make the event something that you actually strategically event, um, attend. Um, prioritizing networking within your calendar. So even if it's just even if it's just two networking events per week, say it's one networking event per week. I'll, I'll give you that one. Say it's one networking event per week and you meet one new person at each event. Just one. Anybody can do that. At the end of the year, you'd have added 52 people to your network. If you met two new people, you'd have added 104 new people to your network. It's just math. 
Like you can do this. You can go to one event, meet one person and add 52 people to your network. The one thing that's great about setting a goal and saying, I'm only going to meet one new person or two new people is 80% of building and maintaining relationships is in the follow-up. Like this is the easy part. Coming here and meeting somebody is the easy part. Having a way to follow up that's where the real work starts. So if you only meet one person, the next day you can thoughtfully follow up with that person and start building that relationship with them. And you already know you've had a great conversation with them. You've had a dopamine inducing conversation. If anybody doesn't know what dopamine is, it's a neurotransmitter in the brain, sits in the pleasure center of our brain. And there are questions you can ask that elicit a dopamine spike in the person's brain that you're talking to. The lowest dopamine inducing questions are how are you and what do you do? And those are the ones that everybody falls back on. I want you to take that out of your repertoire. Okay. Take your list, use your list yourself approach and say, what amazing dopamine inducing questions could I ask of people? Which is why I asked at the beginning of this, what is everybody drinking? What was everybody watching? Like that's when the chat blew up because you want to answer those questions. If I had said, okay, everybody explain to me what you do for a living. You would have been like, oh my God, this is not fun. That's dopamine. So think about it. I want to have one dopamine inducing conversation with each, with one person at one event every week. And at the end of it, I'll have 52 new relationships. And you have no idea what one of those people, two of those people, three of those people in those 52 relationships will do for your career. And then, oh, I already talked about it. Following up. Again, 80% of building, maintaining relationships is just following up. And so many people suck at it. They expect the other person to do the follow-up. If you say, I'm going to be the follow-up master, I'm going to be the Jedi, the unicorn, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to take follow-up as my thing. You will blow the friggin' socks off everybody else who's trying to network because everybody thinks that follow-up is somebody else's job. It's your job. 80% of building and maintaining relationships is just following up and keeping following up and keeping that cadence. So the fifth tool is social media or LinkedIn. I prefer, LinkedIn. I have an Instagram account, um, but for me, biz, for business, I get my mo most of my business off of LinkedIn. So learn how to boss up that profile. Like get a really good picture of yourself. Have a great headline, like my headline, keynote speaker, author, networking coach, sought after business development strategist, everything that I want people to know about me, okay? And then don't, don't just connect willy-nilly. Connect with purpose on LinkedIn. You can connect with anybody on LinkedIn if you do your research and you reach out with purpose. So don't ever send a blank, I, after this, some of you are going to want to connect with me on, with link, on LinkedIn. And I'll connect with each and every single one of you if you say, Julie, I saw you, Julie, you're so awesome. I saw you give this amazing presentation. I wasn't doing anything else. I was totally present during your Cornet presentation. Um, I would love to connect with you on LinkedIn and follow you and learn more about you and like hopefully get together in person someday. But if you send me a thing that says, I'd like to join your, your network on LinkedIn, what's going to happen is I'm going to hit ignore like the 10 other ones I get every single day. You're just noise at that point because I don't know why you want to connect with me. Would you ever reach out? To, would you ever send an email to somebody and just be like, hey, and that's it? No, you have to do your research and know why you want to connect and then tell them why you want to connect. And that's how you connect with purpose. Online interactions and engagements are up over 55% since the pandemic started. LinkedIn is literally in its infancy on what it's going to provide to you in your career and your business going forward. They're, they're putting new, new tools and new strategies for LinkedIn every day. If you're looking for a job, if you're one of those people who have lost their job or you know somebody who's lost their job, 87% of recruiters, 87% of recruiters specifically look, use LinkedIn to find and vet potential candidates. And you can bet your ass if somebody says, hey, do you know Julie Brown? You know what the first place they're going to go is they're going to go to LinkedIn. So I need to make sure that all of my social proof, all the things that say I'm a badass networker, podcast host, author, speaker, that shows up on LinkedIn. All of my recommendations show up on LinkedIn. Like oh, I have activity on LinkedIn. I'm disseminating useful information on LinkedIn. That is super, super, super important. It's all layers. It's never one thing. Like you're going to go to an event and you're going to meet somebody and that person's going to Google you and they're going to go to your LinkedIn profile. And if you, 
if you have a company website, they're going to go to your bio. Like it's all levels of social proof that you have to make sure that you have that help you be like one of the people that people want to be connected with. And then if you have social media, make sure you're just, you're posting useful content. Content for content's sake is noise. So what could you do to post useful, useful content to your followers? Um, so for example, this was a couple of my last posts on LinkedIn. Here was the future of networking that we're doing right now. I don't know what, remember when I pulled these, um, these stats. So there, the viewership is a little bit higher, but eight, 862 people saw that I was going to be speaking to Cornet. I'm doing a keynote next week at the time of pulling this, um, screen shot, 1300 people had seen this. And then I was a guest lecturer uh, a couple of weeks, I don't know, a month ago. At the time that I pulled this, 3,322 people had viewed my post. That's why you need to have a LinkedIn content strategy as part of your personal brand, as part of your networking strategy. Because here's the deal. I don't have time to talk to all of the people in my network every single day, but you know what? They feel like they're talking to me. Between my posts on LinkedIn, they're seeing my picture all of the time. Between my podcast every week, they hear my voice every week. Between my YouTube channel, they can see me uh, on video. The people in my network, they feel like they see me on a daily and weekly basis, even though they don't. And that's how you can start to add a strategy into your networking to constantly be in front of the people in your network. Are there any questions on those before I move on? Nothing in the chat either. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so I mentioned this this quote: "People will do business with and refer business to people they know, like, and trust." So a lot of people, a lot of times, people say, "Well, when can I ask?" When is it okay to ask, hey, I want to work with you. Hey, can I have a job? Hey, hey, can you know you put me on this this list? You know, when can I ask? So I mean, in my experience, it's different for every potential client. Like I've had clients that have literally turned into multi-million dollar clients where I within three months they had turned into multi-million dollar clients. And then I've had clients where I treated them exactly the same, went through that exact same process, and it took me four years to get a million dollar project out of them. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything different or wrong. It's just each client has its own incubation period and when it's they're going to trust you. But there is a little bit of stats around it, okay? So when do people or clients decide? 2% will decide they, they can or will work with you on the, on the first contact. 3% by the second contact, 4% 4, 4 on the third contact, 10% on the fourth contact, and 81% after the fifth contact. And this is what happens. This is when people quit. They quit after the fourth contact because this is what they do. They keep score. They say, okay, I took them to a baseball game. I took them out to lunch. Like I sent them this, like we had this conversation and I'm not getting anything out of it. Well, you didn't get any shit out of it because you don't deserve it because you were keeping score because you weren't building that relationship from an authentic place. Yes, we all want to do business and we all want to be successful, but we can't bully people into doing business with us. We have to be authentic in the way we build relationships. The day you plant the seed is not the day you eat the fruit. And I, in my book, I talk about building relationships like I do with my garden. Like, so I'm getting close to being able to start my garden and each vegetable has a different gestation period. Like my spinach is going to come up first and then the tomatoes are going to take a hundred days and the cucumbers are going to come before then. Zucchinis are just going to start sprouting everywhere. But I never like look at the garden and I've got a ton of zucchinis and turn to the tomato plant and say, you shitty tomato plant. Why haven't you created a tomato yet? Like, look at that zucchini. It's got like 7,000 zucchinis on it. Like, it's going to happen in its own time. And your job is to remain authentic and invested in that relationship until it turns into something. And it will, but most people quit before it does. So... 
literally all we have to do is prioritize networking in our lives, know that we're our number one networking tool, increase the surface area with which you connect with people, build and maintain those relationships by being the follow-up person, by being the person who reaches back out and connects. Find ways to increase your social proof, whether that is writing articles on LinkedIn or participating in panel discussions or just raising your hand when you're when you're scared like and asking the right questions and by not keeping score like literally it's not rocket science like networking is not rocket science i have i have built multiple companies on the fact that i have relationships and people are invested in my success people want to see me succeed um i've made, i mean literally i've i've I have won millions of dollars worth of projects that I have not competed for because people wanted to work with me. So a couple of things about me. I have a podcast that comes out every Wednesday. So the one will come out tomorrow and the Wednesday after that and the Wednesday after that in perpetuity. Um, my book, This Shit Works, which is all about my, at this point, it was 21 years in our industry, building building relationships and doing business. That's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I have a free YouTube channel with, with videos that, um, I don't know, I have like three seasons of videos. And then I post on Instagram a lot, like just tips and whatnot on Instagram. So you can always find me there. I, I believe in giving away as much free information as possible. I mean, the book's 15 bucks, but like, I believe in giving away as much free information as possible because I believe in networking so much and I want everybody else to believe in it too. Um, so that's it for, for me for the presentation. It leaves 15, 14 minutes. I'll stay as long as you want for question and answer. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see your faces. Um, and I'll answer any questions that you have, if I can answer them. I hope I can answer them all. Um, just to kind of get it started so that people kind of open up a little bit. But how would you make networking less scary for colleagues that, you know, maybe they're engineers or whatever, and they're expected to do BD, but they see it as such a scary thing, or they're a little too lax about it. And they're like, oh, well, I see them in the project meeting. And you're like, yeah, but like, that's kind of BD, but you're not really actively connecting with them or doing anything. And, you know, how would you kind of try to make networking a little less scary for that demographic? So it's mostly scary for introverts um, because number one, introverts feel like they go into a room and they're already at a disadvantage because they're not extroverts, which is not the case. Introverts can be the best networking people because they have a couple things up on extroverts. Like extroverts like myself, like I know I can walk into a room and talk to, I can talk to a fire hydrant for 10 minutes, okay? And just be perfectly fine. Like I can walk into any room and talk to anybody all day long. That doesn't mean I'm a good listener. And it doesn't mean I'm prepared. What introverts have over extroverts is they prepare for networking events. And so much of being really good at networking is knowing what kind of room you're going into, who could possibly be there, and the conversations that you could have. And not just winging it because you can talk to a wall for 10 minutes. So introverts are always so good at being prepared and they're much better listeners than extroverts because they're not just waiting for their turn to say something. So I always tell introverts that they shouldn't be afraid of networking because their skills actually excel and make them better at networking than what you might think an extrovert would be better at. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Everyone, feel free to unmute and speak up and ask any questions that you have, or if you're more comfortable in the chat, you can enter them there too. Um, Kristen did say that your podcast comes out the same day as Ty and that guy, and that Wednesday's looking better and better. So what is, I'm gonna, who is who, Kristen, I don't who's know. Ty and that guy? What, what is that? I love that name, but what is that? <laughs> so um, earlier you asked about binging shows, and one of the shows that I... I didn't binge, but I really started watching it during the pandemic was The Expanse. And it's uh, the show that's kind of like the futuristic Star, uh, Star Trek. 
Um, so one of the actors on that show and a writer on that show started a podcast and they basically like go over old time movie act they interview actors and they kind of oh. talk about the behind the scenes um, stories of, of movie making. So yeah. I, I listen to a religious. Okay, so I'll I'll check that out. I'm always like I'm I'm I drive to my vacation house in Vermont every Friday, so it's three and a half hours. So I'm always looking for new content to listen to on those rides. One thing I want to say, I didn't know I was going to know anybody in this thing. Hi, Lizzie, and hi, Brigitte. Ah, I, friendly faces. I didn't know if I was going to know anybody. So that's so great. How do you divide up your day? dedicated to marketing? Do you do mostly mailings? Do you do mostly speeches? How do you plan out your week? Yep. You're balancing everything out. So I create a content calendar for myself. So, okay. So full disclosure, my Instagram, I create all the content, but somebody else posts it for me and, and schedules all the posts for me, but I create the content. Um, my podcast is obviously every Wednesday. So I have a content creation calendar from, for my podcast and I come up with ideas months in advance and then re write, record and edit the podcast and schedule them every Wednesday. So I have a huge podcast um, editorial calendar where I'm like, these are what I want to talk about and these are the dates I'm going to release that. So I need to have that in advance. So when it comes to LinkedIn, I know that every Wednesday, I'm going to post an audiogram of my podcast. I know that on Fridays, I'm going to do a flashback to one of my old videos. Um, and then one other day during the week, I'll post a testimonial. So I have all of that scheduled out because the thing about content is, and personal branding is, if you try to just think of something to do on that day, it, it, it's not going to be you're not going to get the reaction and the effect that you want as if you said, okay, I'm going to talk, I'm going to create a content calendar and these are the days I'm going to post and this is what I want to be presenting on those days. So for me, I lay everything out. It's the Wednesdays, the podcast, Fridays, the flashback, and then one other day is um, the, the testimonial. And then when you have done enough networking and done enough content creation, you have people like Tony who post about you and you don't have to post because she'll post about you and you'll be like, all right, that one's done. You know, so Tony, tell them about that post. Oh yeah. Um, so I did a post about the event, but I did a photo of a couple different um, BD related books that I was checking out. And one of them was The Shit Works by Julie. So it kind of led into advertising about this event again. And it ended up being in the one top 1% 1 of LinkedIn engagement this last week, which is kind of crazy and has, you know, over 2,500 views and had a ton of comments, which was great because now I have a million other books that I have to check out. <laughs> So yeah. it was a, it was a great post. Yeah. I mean, so that's another thing about creating content is I always say, if you want to like sort of dip your toe into content creation, just steal someone else's content and have a comment on it. So literally be like this, these are the five, you know, like Huffington Post did an article on like the five major challenges of working home, working from home during COVID. And this is my take on this article and just write that and then tag other people in it that you've had that, you know, work from home conversation with. And like, that's how, if you start tagging people and then you use the right hashtags, that's how things start getting noticed. Like Tony tagged me in it. So everybody who had read my book commented on her post and was like, oh yeah, this shit works. I mean, I didn't write a book that says this shit doesn't work. Like it's called this shit works. It works for a reason, you know? <laughs> uh, um, there is a, a question from Bridget in the chat that says, can you describe how you establish credibility with prospective clients? Brigitte, I feel like you could answer this question. You are such um, a veteran in this industry, but like for me, how I establish credibility is multi-layered, okay? So a couple of things. I have disseminated so much information and so much free information through my podcast and through my YouTube video that people can go to there to say, okay, this girl knows what she's talking about. I also have made it a beyond my being a part of the National Speakers Association and doing speeches like this, 
I've dedicated my time to being on panel discussions with other people in the industry so that I can show my expertise uh, with a panel of other people. So making sure that my name is associated as an expert with what I want to be known as an expert for. And one thing you'll never be able to flub is just being authentic with your clients and caring about your clients. And that goes a long way with trying to understand what are my pain points of my clients, like having conversation with my prospective clients and my clients and saying, what keeps you up at night? What are your, what are the problems that you're facing that I can possibly help with? And if I can't help with, maybe I can find somebody else who can like always being able to sort of salve that like pain point of your client is really how you establish credibility with them. Every, I mean, it's, it's, it's never one answer. That's a problem. It's never one answer. You always have to be doing multiple things like and, and creating layers to your credibility. Thank you, Julie. I, I just wanted to get your take. And it's great. <laughs> you know, there's always room for improvement, right? So I miss you. your accent, Brigitte. It's been too long. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Julie, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit earlier about doing research both for who you want to look and meet yep. and, and going after perspective possible jobs and things like that? Like, yep. where do you start? What do you do? What's your method? So, and I do this with every single one of my clients because people will come to me and will be like, we want to do business with in, like in this market or whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, who are the potential clients in that market? Who are connected to those? Like, so it's always the client, you know, you want to get to the client, but what if you can't get to the client? What's the, it's like the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, you know? It's like, if this is where I want to get, how many layers of connections do I have to go through to get there? So for me, everybody has, everybody I work with is like, we want to do business with this such and such company. And I'm like, great, you can go right to them and your email is never going to be answered. Or we can figure out how we can triangulate this effort and say, I know this person who has done business with them. I know this person like is a kid who that guy coaches his hockey team. Like I break it down into such minute detail that I have five ways of getting into somebody into a company or getting an intro to somebody, um, which is like one of them's going to work, you know? So that's what I mean by level of research is like really breaking down. What are your degrees of separation to that person? And so like, if it's a company that you want a job at, like, do you know anybody who works there? Do you know anybody who used to work there? Like, do you know anybody who's tangentially connected to that company? And like working those relations, working those um, connections as much as possible, which is why I say you really have to be really good at follow-up because if if those connections are going to come from the outer circle, from the hundred, and you haven't talked to the person in four years, they might not be inclined to help you. But if you are the kind of person who keeps a cadence and reaching back out to people, like that person is more inclined to, to say, oh yeah, let me make that phone call for you. And is LinkedIn what you use mostly for that? So I see somebody, Tony is writing um, LinkedIn sales nav. I use the free version of LinkedIn. I don't use any premium um, uh, aspects of LinkedIn. So Tony, you might want to actually explain how you use it because I only use the free version. Yeah. So sales nav, if you have a client that you're like, oh, I want to work with them, you can go to it and it will show you the tiers of decision makers at that company one through three. And then it also will analyze your connections and say like, this is your best avenue to get connected to that company. And like basically suggest that you ask for an intro or that kind of thing through one of your connections. So whether that LinkedIn connection is a real one or just kind of like a whatever that is <laughs> remains to be kind of seen, but obviously you know your network. So you'll know if that's actually a real um, avenue into getting in there. Cool, thanks. Yeah, of course. It's just a little hack, I guess. <laughs> I have a quick question. Um, when you were talking about LinkedIn, and I'm curious what your thoughts are about if you have random people mm. in your LinkedIn, kind of like you end up with random people in your Facebook feed, would you recommend that you purge the randoms? 
Yeah. So that's an interesting question because a lot of people at first are like, oh, I'm just going to accept everybody because I want to like, I want to get to that 500 plus connections, which is like, we all, some of us have done that. Like, here's the thing. It, that that person not harming you, that person being in your in your um, LinkedIn network is not harming you. It's just, would you want to do anything with that relationship? Would you want to say, hey, you know, we're connected on LinkedIn and we've actually never really talked. Maybe we should do that. Like, I'm trying to strengthen my LinkedIn connections. You could take that avenue. I I, I have I have only purged a couple of people um, from LinkedIn because I no longer believed that their value system was in line with mine and I just didn't want to be connected to them. That's the only reason why I've blocked and, 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 un, and removed people from my LinkedIn connections from when before I was very, very um, you know, adamant about only accepting connections from people who I, I knew. Got it. So hypothetically, if they have a lack of integrity or whatnot, I would purge them. Purge them. Thank <laughs> you. Appreciate it. Julia, I have a question, um, and it's a follow up from what you were saying earlier about, you know, men tending to have more transactional networking interactions. And I was just curious how, what are some tips to have more of those transactional? Sure. So the issue with women is women don't want to be a bother and women don't want to be perceived as weak because we're asking for something or perceived as a nuisance. And men don't think that way. And the men can chime in like men are very okay doing business with friends, doing business with people who aren't their friends, like stating what they need. And women have this thing where we feel like we're the second sex, we're the weaker sex. And if we ask for, you know, if we ask for help or we ask for something, like somehow that's a that's an example of that. Women have to be comfortable stating what they need to succeed and being okay with that. And women need to be okay talking with other women about how much money they make, what kind of benefits they have, like what the culture of their company is like. Because without that, we don't have ammunition to go into, you know, negotiations to know how much we should be making. And so women need to be okay saying, I want to do business with you. I'd like to work with you. How can we work together? Um, that's what we're networking for. Like we're networking to be able to increase, to do business with each other. And just saying that is like, I'd really love to do business with you. How can we make that happen? Is not gratuitous, but women always are. I, so many people that I coach say to me, I don't know how to ask for business. And I'm like, you ask for it. You can't get what you don't ask for. So you have to start being comfortable asking for business. And if you have to call, like, call, Kristen, call me and do like a call and be like, I have this client and we've been dancing around each other <laughs> for like four years and I've never had the um, guts to say, like, I'd like to do business with you. Practice that phone call on me. Like, you have to be comfortable asking for what you need and what and and what is going to increase your, you know, your success. And And women are reticent to do that. Thanks. Um, another question in the chat is asking if you have another book coming soon. You know, as soon as I finished the book, I was like, I'm going to write another one. It's going to be called This Shit Works Too. And <laughs> then then I started the podcast and I it takes a lot to produce, to, to write, record and edit and produce a podcast every week. And that really sort of scratched that itch of having to disseminate information. And I do think I have another book in me. I just, I'm not sure when it will, when it will be. Great. Um, another question. Uh, when it com comes time to make the ask, is there an approach that is more respectful and effective than others, considering some relationships may be stronger than others? That's so from go, Sunny. So go back, Sunny, go back to have you shown integrity and trust in your interactions with that person? Like, have you had multiple interactions with that person in which you 
you showed your integrity and the fact that they can trust you. And if you haven't, then say, how can I be that example? Um, because w- business makes the world go round. We're all in here to do business with each other. We're all in here to have clients, to make our clients happy. You know, st- you can say, listen, you are the kind of client that I want to have. I want to, you know, you exemplify what I want in a client. I know we'd work really well together. Have I, ex- have I ex- have I shown to you that I'm worthy of a working relationship with you? And if I haven't, tell me what I need to do. Like, I always say honesty is the best policy. Love that. Any other start questions? Start swearing, Sonny. Start <laughs> swearing. We all know it works. <laughs> what do I have to fucking do? Like, <laughs> Sonny, you can tell them why I said that. That's true. Um, Julie's podcast, which was my first introduction to her, and the first one that I landed on was how um, using swear words and cursing words can actually might act, help you express certain feelings more effectively than others in a business setting. And since then, my wife loves it. Th- loves the theory. And, um, <laughs> it's it's it teaches you how to express yourself a little better. The podcasts are simply awesome. They're bite sized. You can understand it quick, packed with information. Check it out, guys. <laughs> I love that one. And I that love the one of my favorite ones to research too. It was like, so great with the gorillas like, there's, too. There's a world renowned expert on swearing. I was like, I've missed my calling. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. Uh, any other questions before we wrap up? Last minute questions. All right. Well, Julie, thank you so much. This was so fun to plan and sit up with you. And I feel like I got so much out of this. So thank you again for doing this. Yeah. And if anybody has any questions, Julia, juliebrownbd.com, or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Just like, tell me you met me here. Um, and we can correspond on LinkedIn too. Awesome. I just uh, put your email in the chat. So if anyone needs it. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. See ya.